Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making the start of my review of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. So I'm going to read you the blurb, go into some of my tabs. I should point out my edition of this is terrible as well, it's already falling apart. Uh, okay, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. The famous tale of a boy's life in a small town on the banks of the Mississippi River. Tom skips school and with his friends Huck, Finn and Jim, spends his days on mad adventures. Some real, some imagined. Like Tom himself, this book is happy and cheerful, exciting but also funny. First published in 1876, it remains one of the best and most popular stories about a boy and his adventures. Which seems to me like a very specific category to put it under. Obviously there's some stuff with kind of racism and just uh, old ways of thinking in this. Uh, we do have a preface here written in Hartford in 1876. And I think that makes this kind of amusing as well. Most of the adventures recorded in this book really occurred. One or two were experiences of my own. The rest of those boys who were schoolmates of mine. Huck Finn is drawn from life, Tom Sawyer also, but not from an individual. He is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom I knew, and therefore belongs to the composite order of architecture. The odd superstitions touched upon were all prevalent among children and slaves in the West at the period of this story, that is to say 30 or 40 years ago. Although my book is intended mainly for the entertainment of boys and girls, I hope it will not be shunned by men and women on that account, for part of my plan has been to try pleasantly to remind adults of what they once were themselves, and, have ha and of how they felt and thought and talked, and what queer enterprises they sometimes engaged in. Quite a nice little introduction there, I feel. And so Tom, yeah, he has to, he has to whitewash a fence, and because of that it says, 30 yards of broad fence, 9 feet high, it seemed to him that life was hollow and existence but a burden like some real real angst there but i agree with him as well life is hollow and existence is nothing but a burden hey ho got to keep on smiling anyway and and besides he's all right because he, he figures out a plan to basically trick other people into doing the work for him he actually gets them to like pay him to let them do the paint the fence because he kind of portrays it as you know ha i get to paint the fence and you don't so yeah, basically Tom tricks everybody into painting this fence for him and, and they actually pay him to let him let them do it. And it says here, Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it. Namely, that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that, pl and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers, or performing on a treadmill, is work, whilst rolling nine pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches 20 or 30 miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, then they would turn it into work. Then they would resign. And uh, here we see, I don't want to say like a familiar face, but somebody who is well known in literature, you know. Shortly Tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by the mothers of the town because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad, and because all their children admired him so, and delighted in his forbidden society, and wished they dared to be like him. We get a bunch of uh, N-words being dropped here, but you can hardly be surprised about that, I, I guess. It is uh, the time period and all that. He does say you can... I never see... Uh, uh, he says, well, what of it? They'll all lie. Leastways, all but the... I don't know him, but I never see a... That wouldn't lie. And it's like, Jesus Christ, Mark Twain. And this is all happening at the same time where... Um, th there's a very strange conversation going on. Say, what is dead cats good for, Hook? Good for? Cure warts with? No, is that so? I know something that's better. I bet you don't. What is it? Why, spunk water. Spunk water? I wouldn't give a dern for spunk water. Let me get down here. Uh, aha, talk about trying to cure warts with spunk water. Such a blame full way as that. Why, that ain't a going to do any good. You got to go by yourself to the middle of the woods where you know there's a spunk water stump. And just as it's midnight, you back up against the stump and jam your hand in and say, Barley corn, barley corn, engine meal shorts. Spunk water, spunk water, swallow these warts. And then walk away quick, 11 steps with your eyes shut. And then turn around three times and walk home without speaking to anybody. Because if you speak, the charm's busted. Well, that sounds like a good way, but that ain't the way Bob Tanner done. No sir, you can bet he didn't, because he's the wartiest boy in this town, and he wouldn't have a wart on him if he'd knowed how to spurk spunk water. I've took off thousands of warts off of my hands that way. And then he says, if uh, spunk water doesn't work, you can use a bean. All the innuendo in this, all of the innuendo. We have this pretty odd thing. Um, what I like is chewing gum. Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now. Do you? 
I've got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. Okay. You can have this horrible chewing, horrible pre-chewed chewing gum back, I guess. Why not? I thought this was quite an interesting little bit here as well. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws anymore, and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. Of course, nowadays, the President of the United States is an outlaw. Way Political joke! We have an interesting choice of words here, very old school. He had to keep still long after she went to bed, for she kept making broken-hearted ejaculations from time to time, tossing unrestfully and turning over. It's one of the things is I feel as though a lot of the stuff that I found interesting in this is the old school uses of language, you know? And then the kids are smoking, it says, uh, After a dainty egg and fish dinner, Tom said he wanted to learn to smoke now. Joe caught at the idea and said he would like to try too. So Hook made pipes and filled them. These novices had never smoked anything before, but cigars made of grapevine, and they bit the tongue and were not considered manly anyway. Uh, which, yeah, I'm trying to quit smoking at the time of filming. I'm on about five and a half days. I thought this was pretty cool, this, uh, this bit of characterization here, which I'm going to read out. And there's also a little hat tip to Grey's Anatomy as well, which is the book that doctors, you know, learn to doctor from. Poor girl, she did not know how fast she was nearing trouble herself. The master, Mr. Dobbins, had reached middle age with an unsatisfied ambition. The darling of his desires was to be a doctor, but poverty had decreed that he should be nothing higher than a village schoolmaster. Every day he took a mysterious book out of his desk and absorbed himself in it at times when no classes were reciting. He kept that book under lock and key. There was not an urchin in school but was perishing to have a glimpse at it, but the chance never came. Every boy and girl had a theory about the nature of that book, but no two theories were alike, and there was no way of getting at the facts in the case. Now as Becky was passing by the desk, which stood near the door, she noticed that the key was in the lock. It was a precious moment. She glanced around, found herself alone, and the next instant she had the book in her hands. The title page, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, carried no information to her mind. So she began to turn the leaves. She came at once upon a handsomely engraved and coloured frontispiece, a human figure. At that moment a shadow fell on the page and Tom Sawyer stepped in at the door and caught a glimpse of the picture. Becky snatched at the book to close it and she had the hard luck to tear the pictured page half down the middle. She thrust the volume into the desk, turned the key and burst out crying with shame and vexation. And good old Tom, later on he takes the rap so the teacher notices this tear and um, he bl he says that he did it. Uh, then we get um, Twain taking the piss out of some um, like poetry and stuff. He actually says at the end of the chapter, Note, the pretended compositions quoted above are taken without alteration from a volume entitled Prose and Poetry by a Western Lady, but they are exactly and precisely after the schoolgirl pattern, and hence are much happier than any mere imitations could be. And I like this because of this poem here. It's got a, got a French word in it. A Missouri maiden's farewell to Alabama. Alabama, goodbye, I love thee well, but yet for a while do I leave thee now. Sad, yes, sad thoughts of thee my heart doth swell, and burning recollections throng my brow. For I have wandered through thy flowery woods, have roamed and read near Tallapoosa's stream, have listened to Tallassee's warring floods, and wooed on Coosa's side Aurora's beam. Yet shame I not to bear an o'erfull heart, nor blush to turn behind my tearful eyes. Tis from no stranger land I now must part, tis to no strangers left I yield these sighs. Welcome and home were mine within this state, whose veils I leave, whose spires fade fast from me. And cold must be mine eyes and heart and tets, when clear Alabama they turn cold on thee. And it says, there were very few there who knew what tet meant, but the poem was very satisfactory nevertheless. It means head. I thought this bit here was quite interesting too, uh, at the start of chapter 23. Tom joined the new order of cadets of temperance, being attracted by the showy character of their regalia. He promised to abstain from smoking, chewing and profanity as long as he remained a member. Now he found out a new thing, namely that to promise not to do a thing is the surest way in the world to make a body want to go and do that very thing. Tom soon found himself tormented with a desire to drink and swear. The desire grew to be so intense that nothing but the hope of a chance to display himself in the red sash kept him from withdrawing from the order. We have this incredibly dark bit here as well that kind of freaks me out. Um, um, this guy, these, these outlaws, one of them goes, but I'll take it out of her. Oh, don't kill her. Don't do that. Kill? Who said anything about killing? I would kill him if he was here, but not her. When you want to get revenge on a woman, you don't kill her. Bosh. You go for her looks. You slit her nostrils. You notch her ears like a sow's. That is unpleasant and also deeply disturbing. Just two more little bits I want to highlight here before we bring this review to a close. So bear in mind these are kids talking, uh, it's Hook and Tom talking. 
Now let's fetch the guns and things, said Huck. No, Huck, leave them there. They're just the tricks to have when we go to robbing. We'll keep them there all the time, and we'll hold our orgies there too. It's an awful snug place for orgies. What's orgies? I don't know, but robbers always have orgies, and of course we've got to have them too. I think that's probably the first time I've ever seen orgies talked about in a children's book. And I think this is quite dark, and also quite amusing, because again, it uses the elder language, so it uses the old version of gay. Um, when are you going to start the gang and turn robbers? Oh, right off. We'll get the boys together and have the initiation tonight, maybe. Have the witch? Have the initiation. What's that? It's to swear to stand by one another and never tell the gang's secrets, even if you're chopped all to flinders, and kill anybody and all his family that hurts one of the gang. That's gay. That's mighty gay, Tom, I tell you. Yes. I mean, I'm not sure what they mean by gay there, actually, because it's not happy either. Like, oh, yes, we're going to chop everybody's family up to bits. So, yeah, that's what I made of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. All in all, I thought it was okay. I gave it, like, a three out of five because it was kind of slow at times. There were some really kind of decent bits of dialogue and some funny ideas here and there. But my problem with this is the same as it was with The Prince and the Pauper that, that Twain also wrote, where, yes, it's good. But it just feels dense for what it is. And during between about the 50 and 75% marks in both of those books, it got a little boring. But overall, I, I mean, I would recommend it. It's a classic, you know, for a reason. I'd recommend most classics that I've read. So yeah, that's what I thought of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Swain. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.